this is Mark uh, uh, part two. Um, and this is January 18th of the new year. Um, so uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this uh, evening. We thank you for your word. Lord, we pray, O oh Lord, that um, someone would benefit um, of your word, of the material. Lord, that we would gain insight. Lord, whether we um, have our lights turned on for us now or later, O oh Lord, I pray that we're taking it in, O oh Lord, for the right time, O oh Lord, to use for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, let me share my screen. Okay, so as usual, before we uh, get to anything, so I added, well, let, actually, before I do that, um, so just in keeping, I keep adding to these documents I'm putting out there. Um, this one is the one on textual insights. So last time, you know, the, the Bible translation sometimes may use different, may say, for instance, Psalm 73, 1, pierced or grieved, right? When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, sometimes they use pierce, which is kind of dif different from grieved, right? Either way, it means wounded, but one of them is more specific than the other. In this case, maybe it doesn't mean that much, but uh, for Psalm 22, 16, let's see, I just added, uh, Jews will say, well, did, I'm not gonna get into all this because it takes a while, but the word for pierce or grieved or pinned or dug um, is a word that's not used in modern Hebrew. So if you ask a Jew, you know, let's say, but that word, you know, is gobbledygook or something, but modern, but we have to distinguish that the Hebrew, old Hebrew, uh, biblical Hebrew, it's not always the same as modern Hebrew. Um, and so they'll say that Jesus, Jesus quotes this, right? He quotes from Psalm 22 when he's on the cross and elsewhere about, you know, piercing his feet and um, being left alone by God, uh, being, you know, being left abandoned. So Psalm 22 is a key, it's a key um, Psalm. And, I, you know, and coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, it comes before Psalm 23 about the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one that guides me and so forth. That's going to come in. We'll look at that later. So um, this is the one where in the New International Verses, dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Um, at the time, it meant nothing, right, to the Jew. But as Jesus comes on the scene and afterwards, Jesus already is talking about being pinned to the cross, basically. So it's, a lot of this after the fact makes sense, right? Luke 24, 44 and 45, then Jesus opened their eyes after his resurrection to his disciples or their understanding or their minds to what the scriptures had said about him. And so he walks him through, he must have walked them through this one because this is a key one, Psalm 22. There's different verses here in Psalm 22 that relate to what was happening, what was supposed to happen um, to him, but people did not get it. And in a sense, you can't really blame them because why would they think that would have happened, even though it's sort of in there, but it's kind of mixed in. A lot of times got, um, we saw in Mark 13 that Jesus is speaking about, he's asked about the temple, about his destruction, but then he's also mixing in the, his, his coming. So even the New Testament church was kind of confused because Paul talks about this, you know, people say, well, the Lord came already or we missed it or what happened? So God does this in the Old Testament. Uh, at the same time, you might think probably for different for a number of reasons. One is, you know, I think one obvious reason is just as um, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 8, right? It says none of the rulers of this world understood this for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He knows that it's not just us that is studying this stuff, that's reading this, or that knows this information. So do the powers and the rulers and authorities and dominions and thrones, right, of the spiritual world. So he's not just going to spell it out for them, because um, we're all looking at the same information, except they have more information because they've been here even before, um, prior to our creation, as Job, I believe, 38 says. So... Everything and plus, and then there's others that, that were always looking at scripture, even if they weren't um, faithful to Yahweh. Perhaps we know of them of other countries. We even you even have 
right? The Magi, when they come in, we call them the Magi, but then they weren't magicians or anything. But um, the court officials, right, when they come in from far away, they were also reading. Remember the one um, when Philip, after the resurrection of Jesus, um, the Holy Spirit comes down and they're spreading out. And Philip, one of the apostles, um, he's he's transported by the Holy Spirit. He's moved, right? And he, he ends up walking alongside this, uh, this Ethiopian official. And he's reading the Psalm, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 53. And he he's trying to figure this out. Like, what, what am I looking at here? I mean, why did he have that? Where's he coming from? So anyway, Psalm 22, 16 is another one that is contended. But so if you look at some of the translations on some of these, it'll say, they pierce my hands and my feet. Um, English standard, they pierce my hands and my feet. If you keep looking on some of these, they may, they may change. I, I you can get these off from uh, biblehub.com. I just put them on here. Um, this one says tearing at my hands and my feet, which may be a little different depending on how it's translated. They have dug, here goes, the way rhymes is a Catholic Bible. They have dug my hands and my feet, but you can kind of maybe take that for, it depends, you know, you have to, no one understood it at the time. It's after the fact you go back, you're like, oh, that's what that meant. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave that for, um, here's Zechariah 12, 10 related to this It's clear here. It says when they took on me, and of course, there's a lot of Zechariah passages that's related to Jesus. So that's the second to last book of the old Testament. So that's, a, that's a key book. I mean, is it, it's, 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 uh, what is it? 14 chapters, but they're brief. Um, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace. So this is at the end times, right? And please for mercy so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced. So God is the one that's speaking, but how could they have cut me? You know, it's like they, so it kind of, it only makes sense after the fact that speaking of Jesus, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn, which is kind of, at the time, if you read, it doesn't really make sense because he just said there's going to be, you know, he's going to restore things, but then there's going to be sadness. I mean, so it's only, again, uh, is after the fact you, you, you sort of understand that. This one I'm not going to go into, but uh, maybe some other time. Colossians 2.4 speaks of arguments. Arguments aren't necessarily uh, like apologetics. Apologetics is a field of, um, of explaining. It comes from the word apology, apologia, from the Greek, even from the New Testament. But it doesn't mean to be apologetic. You know, it doesn't mean to, to go around and say, I'm sorry. It means to give answers. Um, you know, fortunately, that's the term that, that we use now for, you know, saying I'm sorry, but that, that's what it means. Um, giving good arguments. So Colossians 2.4 speaks of this. And um, sometimes when you read this, maybe it's not totally understood. So for instance, in here in English version, I say this in order that no one may delude, he's speaking to the, you know, uh, the church at Colossae and Laodicea, which is nearby. This is uh, modern day Turkey. And I say this in order, this is the one that comes in Laodicea in Revelation 3, uh, 14 to 22. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Well, on the surface, that sounds fine. I mean, what plausible, you know, reasonable. Um, but you keep reading and then, you know, it's explained what these so-called plausible arguments are, right? Um, that they're according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world. Um, things that sound good that 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 or hear persuasive speech that's not from God you know that's enticing words so this may be a clearer one from the English from the King James version so you sort of are smooth rhetoric right you got some shites that they're really smooth they're really charismatic in their speech and they're really you know smooth talkers so it kind of depends on the, if you just read it you say well yeah we want to be reasonable that sounds well oh you know we have to also be well crafted in our arguments for Christ but you, so that's this is why you have to read it in context. We just pull it out from Colossians 2 4. You don't know what it's talking about here, fine sounding arguments, reasonable in other words. But when you keep reading, there's, he's saying it from the perspective of those that are trying to sell you a bill of goods. And in this case, in Colossians, they were trying to take people. Uh, it's a short book, right? Just four chapters, but they're, they're, people were sort of um, pitting angels and maybe praying to angels and thinking that angels. Um, you know, could be prayed to and that kind of thing. So because of where they came from, their, their backgrounds and so forth. So let's keep going. So these are, you get these all from biblehub.com. 
I just put them out there just for, so here goes 2 Corinthians 10, 5, but we're told to do this. Uh, let me bold that. This we're told to do. Uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Um, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. In Colossians 2, it also talks about you being taken captive, you know, by uh, philosophy and empty deceit. But it's based on human tradition um, and, and those kinds of things. Um, it's not that the arguments themselves are bad. It's the it's the the um, the kind of arguments, the kind of reasoning that people come up with, right? Um, I, I don't want to talk about that that crazy guy, that so called pastor that um, Bonnie was even mentioning as well that uh, was out there in the news, right, doing that silly thing with the spit and the whole thing. But that's what happens. People start. Um, they start reasoning these things out and said, well, you know, if God did it, by the way, what he did, what Jesus did was not unusual to him. Uh, some of the rabbis would do the same thing because it was believed that um, you had a, a certain blessing from God, but this was done for certain situations for healing. So it wasn't unusual, but it wasn't like people going around and, you know, uh, lobbing spit at people and that kind of thing. Yeah. Did, uh, did, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you see the apology video that he made? No, because it's not, to me, it's not worth, yeah, I'll, I'll I accept it, but they have plenty of time. You know, once you're in that position, you what you do is you, you bring down the work of Christ in so yeah. many minds and they said, this the right. whole thing is a joke. Yeah. 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 So he, he, had he had plenty of time. It, it was a shtick that they were doing. And yeah. um, that's not the first thing. Uh, there's a lot of other nonsense that people do, and they think it's cute at the time because they're kind of mm -hmm. bored. They don't really have any depth, so right. it's entertainment time, you know, to get people jazzed up. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. Gross. <laughs> and that that other guy, at some point, he's he's gonna hit him later, and he's gonna think, Yeah. Why did why I agree? Did to I this? <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? That was his brother, apparently. That's even worse. <laughs> that, yeah, apparently, I guess they spoke it out and they and then, but then in his apology video, he was like, oh, I looked at it and it was, I saw it was so gross. It was disgusting. And, you know, it's just that I wanted people to try to get the concept of, you know, what Jesus did when he spit in the eyes and he, <laughs> with the blind and I apologize and all that stuff. So, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know how they flipped that coin and, and went like, all right, you know, I'll do the spit and you take it. The other guy should have said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's going on here? <laughs> so apparently he's a, he's a slow one. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, that's okay. So Colossians 2, 215, he's another one. This is under the um, textual insights. So textual text, right? This is what scholars do the same thing, but we can do the same thing to figure out, that's, that's what's good when you read a passage, read it in as many translations as possible, um, then look up the word, but just not the word, you gotta also bring it back to the context. So if you just bring up the word, it doesn't mean anything, you wanna see how it's being used. So in this case, Colossians 2.15, um, it says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The English standard version says, uh, by triumphing over them in him, meaning Christ. But you could also look at the Berean Bible, by having triumphed over them in it. So if you look um, at the, well, I'll let you do that. But in the, if you go to biblehub.com or another one, you look, you, you click on um, interlinear, it's not gonna, you're not gonna see the cross. That's not in there. So what they're doing is if you, you, if you read it in context, uh, it says, uh, having, uh, making peace by the blood of his cross. Uh, this comes from Colossians 1. So this is what is being spoken about. So for clarity, that's why they put that in there. But that's not in there. So, but you could understand what they're trying to do. So, so And that same word, the word that's in there, it could be him, or like it says here, it, or even in the King James, right? Um, but it's, so it's, either way it works, right? Triumphing over them in Christ or in the cross, in his cross. So um, sometimes you might read something, somebody says something, and then you say, oh yeah, yeah. And then you look it up later, maybe in your own translation, you don't find it and you try and figure out, oh, did I, that, may, that sounded good when I heard it. 
this is why you should always take notes, write it down, put the, you know, maybe a translation, whatever, and then look it up and see how other translators are translating it. Uh, for anybody that's interested, that's uh, kind of like the explanation there from the uh, NET Bible. Um, I believe I added, I'll just skip through this one. Um, okay. So anyway, that's out there. Okay, this one keeps coming back over and over. Um, so this is the one, uh, Isaiah 6. I'll just keep adding to this because this is permeates uh, the New Testament, also in the Old, right? Um, and some take this so literally every time. All these passages what I'm trying to show is just because it says it, Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, keep on hearing. So th this is, so anyway, taking the context. And I heard the voice of, this is Isaiah, of the Lord saying, this is after the great vision that he sees, right? The Lord lifted up, right? In the train of his robe, filling the temple, the whole thing. He says, and God says, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am. Hi, send me. And God says, okay. He says, go and say to this people, give them the, the worst, the worst, <laughs> um, the, the sort of like the worst message. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears and their ears heavy and, and blind their eyes and that they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And so you have to take it in context and then see how it's used every time or how in the New Testament is being used. You know, um, if we're talking about humans, we could say that God is hurt, right? God is pain. God is grieved because how many times does God have to do something and they continue to go the other way? And so this comes up a lot. So I'm not going to go through all those, those we, we already gone through. Um, so I added a few more. I mean, there's a lot, but you know, um, you're gonna, you just see this everywhere. Sometimes you don't notice it, but it's there. So here in John 6, 44, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. So some take that very literally that you cannot come to God. You can't do anything unless God picks you. That, be, that turns into something else. But that, is that what they're saying? The same chapter, verse 65. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted so, the, so this is why you want to go to interlinear, say biblehub.com and go through all the translations and see how this word is being translated. Unless it is granted by him, uh, granted him by the father. So granting could be a different thing or drawn. So what exactly? So for instance, and I don't want to get to this theological debate thing, but for instance, Calvinists are known for saying that this has to do with being regenerated or predestined or made to come or compelled that you have no choice. God's going to draw you no matter what. Others will say that what it's saying is uh, God is enabling you, right? He's giving you grace so you can wake up, so you can stop resisting, so you can see. Or he calls you or he invites. Um, so if, if these are important, um, not just, this is called a proof text. For, for instance, for um, Calvinists, for instance, they go here, there's one of the main texts. But you also have to take it in context and not just stay there. You want to go elsewhere and see if that's the case elsewhere, or if this is, and then you can go back and say, wait a minute, no, this, it must mean this, because elsewhere we see something else, or we see more clarity, right? So uh, I've had a few here. So Acts 28, 28, this is how it ends. Acts 28 ends this way. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God, this is Paul, he's, he's, he's imprisoned, and he's had the Jews come to him from the synagogue, and he's witnessing to them, and he's telling him about Christ, and he's pointing things out, and they know he has credentials, and some of them accepted the Lord and others, they went and were like, no, nah, I don't think so. He says, therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. So, you know, if you have Isaiah 6, 9 and 10 in the back of your mind, then you're saying, oh, they're, they're, they're becoming, God is through, through, through Paul is speaking to them and they're not, they, they don't want to get it. Some did get it, and others were like, no, no, we're not going to do that. So he's, what he's saying is they will listen. I mean, so or, or if we're going to go back to what, for instance, and again, I'm not trying to get into this conversation, but because that's more like theology. Um, if we get into the point, let's say, with the Calvinist says, no, God compels him, he makes him come. Then Paul here is saying that God is going to make all the Gentiles come too. But that's not the case because most people go to hell. 
right? So we have to take that in context. In other words, um, just like Jesus said that the um, Sodom and Gomorrah would have listened, you know, um, uh, had they seen what you see. So some people are blinded because they want to be blinded. And this brings us to Proverbs 9, uh, 9. But it's really the whole chapter, but this, I'm just going to breeze through this because this is, um, this is key. We have wisdom. Wisdom is a female, but she's not a woman. She's portrayed as a woman, but uh, even the word is, um, uh, is feminine, but it's grammatical. So it's not like it's, it's really a woman because wisdom is also used of Christ, okay, in Proverbs 8, maybe. It does, you know, from 22 to 32, some believe that, some don't. Same thing in uh, 1 Corinthians 1. So here, wisdom, you have wisdom and we have folly. Okay, so here's the difference with, all these are related to, to Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. Um, so uh, let me just briefly real quick. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars, right? It has to do with completion, perfection. She has slaughtered her beasts, whatever. She's done everything she's supposed to do. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, so that's key. Um, doesn't mean that you're a dummy or anything. Whoever doesn't let have understanding. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. You know, come in here. To him who lacks sense. So a lot of times, these are Hebraisms, where you see one part, one line, and the next part is really saying the same thing in a different way. Um, sometimes you go like, hey, this is a new thing. No, it's really a lot of times the same thing. Sometimes it does it in four sentences. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed, right? Jesus is talking about the bread and wine. This has to do with just nutrition because that's what most people had. It wasn't the kind of wine we have. It was really to dilute the, the uh, uh, to help have the water be passable because a lot of water was, you know, a lot of times contaminated. People were washing there and everything, you know, that kind of thing, or had sulfur smells or stinks, you know. The Romans would do the same thing and add stuff to their wine. Um, and the bread, a lot of times, is just, a, you know, word for food, but the bread was nutritious, you know, that was their protein as well. Come eat of my bread and drink of my wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of, of insight. This comes up all right, all, everywhere. Whoever corrects a scoffer, that is a mocker, gets himself abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So this is everywhere as well that the Lord is calling people to meditate on his word, to go further, not just to be on the surface and just, you know, like in Acts 17, when Paul goes to the Areopagus and he's speaking to them, he's giving them, speaking of God's wisdom or the first four chapters, first Corinthians, for instance, for by me, your ways will be multiplied and your years will be added to life. Uh, if you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will hear it. So if you, if you hear it and you mock it anyway, right, Romans 1 and Romans 2, then you continue to, to seal yourself away from God. That's what happens. The woman, uh, the woman folly is loud. In other words, she's boisterous. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat at the high places of the town. So she's doing the same thing, the wisdom. She's competing. There's a competition for your attention. Calling to those who pass by, same thing that wisdom is doing, except you could tell what she's doing, right? She's like, it's essentially, when, when it talks about seduction, like prostitutes were at the gates. Um, you see this in scripture and other ancient cultures, that's, that's what they say. Who are going, so passive people are coming in, she goes, Psst, say, mira, calling people out. Who are, uh, who are going straight on their way? Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. Saying the same thing, sounds like the same message. Right. Uh, and to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. You know, let's be mischievous. Uh, it's like, you know, Vegas, whatever, you know, happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas. But he who does not know, but he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Um, I think it's another passage that, um, elsewhere where it kind of repurposes this. And the way it, it brings it out is that her, uh, her legs go down, our roots go down to Sheol, to the dead. But you don't know that. So her legs are all the way down there. It's basically like her arms are up here and she's grabbing you. She's pulling you down. Um, 
this Rephaim, well, I won't go there. I just leave that there. I'm not gonna get there. This has to do with the uh, wicked spirits. The wicked spirits are there. This is from the Bible, um, but they don't normally translate that. Actually, they do translate Rephaim. Um, okay, finishing with this judicial hardening. Um, this is whether God directs um, the hardening of our hearts. This is a story. I like the story. Um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, let me zip through it. Otherwise, we're not. Uh, these are all important. This all has to do with the same thing. I mean, it, it's a it's a mantra that uh, a tract that's going through scripture, particularly in the New Testament. So you know, we have to um, get that in our um, on our pegboards. Um, so this is important. So I, I, I'm not going to read it. I, I just if if you know the story, this is Micaiah. Um, he's imprisoned. Uh, King Jehoshaphat from Judah goes up to or goes down to Israel, um, and the king of Israel, Ahab, remember Ahab, uh, where Elijah has slaughtered his, uh, his 400 prophets, and he says, you know, hey, uh, the Syrians, you know, they got this territory, we should get it back, and so Ahab says, all right, and so he gets all his hundreds of fake prophets to tell him what he wants to hear, and they all say, um, yeah, go up, for the Lord will give it in the hand of the king, you know, you'll be success successful. But Jehoshaphat, he kind of, maybe he knew something was up. And he says, um, even though he had no business being, you know, in communication with, you know, with them because he knows they were vile. Anyway, uh, there's yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Michael, because King Jehoshaphat said, hey, is there anybody else? I mean, what's going on? So he says, yes, there is. Okay. Um, so anyway, so they, the guy that goes to get Micaiah to bring him to the king, King Ahab, he said, listen, everybody already said, you know, what they're supposed to say. So he said, let your word be like the word of one of them. One of them, all of them were the same. Just pick one and speak favorably. Just tell him what he wants to hear. And I, Micaiah said, I'm going to tell him whatever, you know, comes, the Lord tells me to tell him. So he's asked, he says, okay, uh, what does the Lord say? And the Lord says, go up and try him. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But he must have done it in a mocking way, like mocking the prophets, because the king said immediately, he says, how many times, King Ahab, how many times shall I, shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Like he even cared. Um, and before that, <laughs> the story goes that he, when Jehoshaphat says, there's nobody else, he said, yeah, but he never tells me what I want to hear. So he already knew. So he's sealing his own fate. See, this is, a, this is how this relates to it, Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, the, the hardening, seeing, and not seeing, not, you know, hearing, not hearing. Because they know that's what makes it worse when you know, but you just don't, you don't care. You don't want to hear it. You just want, just, just tell me what I want to hear. Just be done with it. Um, and so he told them, I saw all of Israel and then you were scattered. If you went out there, whatever, the, one of his fake prophets, they, they beat him. And he said, okay, and as for you, you're going to stay alive, but you're going to be in the cave for the rest of your life, hunkering down, being afraid. Um, so this, so, but this is the part I want to get to here. In verse 19, this is 1 Kings 22. Um, he says, My, Micaiah tells Ahab, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab? Now, this is God doing this. This, was, this is why they, they call this the judicial hardening, right? Or the, or the judicial decree. Um. Who will entice Ahab? Now he, he's asking the spirits. Who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Fall means to die, right? Just like sleep means uh, to be dead. And once and and one said one thing and another another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, and said, "I will entice him." And the Lord said, "By what means?" So God is allow. Uh, there's a there's another big area. But I'm not going to get to this, uh, what the Lord allows his spirits to do, the, the heavenly realm. And he said, uh, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. This, this was his idea. And he said, you are to entice him. And God says, okay, and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster to you. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to get into that too much, but uh, that 
you can see that, in other words, God is hands on. All right, let me skip through this one. Second Thessalonians 2, 8 to 12, you can read that. Um, but here, people, they want to listen. And God says, therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So that's the key, right? Just like Romans 1. This is the way it ends, that they not only do those, the wicked things, the things that they know that is ab abhorrent to God, but they encourage others to do the same. So this is with people that have knowledge, um, but they refuse to go God's way. And so God here says he sends them a strong delusion. So he's helping them out. So that's what you want. Remember Pharaoh? Same thing. He didn't start out that way. Uh, he gave him a chance. But as soon as he said, nope. As soon as he starts seeing the plays, he said, wait a minute. And his own people must have told him, hey, we can't do this. This guy is powerful. This is a real deal. He said, nope. Guy says, okay, now I'm going to help you out. Um, contradictions. Uh, yeah, I'll, leave this. I'll, 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 leave, uh, I'll leave this for next time. Otherwise, we're not going to get to it. I'll just mark it here. But anyway, it's out there for you. Uh, let's get away from that. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so if we go to Mark 14, uh, so just to situate ourselves, remember Mark 13, Jesus is being asked about the temple and what's going to happen with the temple, uh, right? They say, you know, look at these beautiful stones, they're huge and massive and wonderful. I mean, it was a splendor, one of the world wonders of the ancient world. And he tells them two things, what, uh, what is going to happen and when is going to happen? But not really when, technically, but many of them took it as such. They took it very literally. Uh, so he mixes in the destruction of the temple and the coming of the day of the Lord. And so that's why a lot, there were a lot of confusion about that. Um, but that, that happens quite a bit. Um, so Jesus comes in, and it's three days before um, the feast. This is at the end, by the way, a lot of times when you look at the parallels between the four gospels, they don't always match up, right? They're not only telling these similar stories, but when it comes to the, the last week, what is called the passion narrative, the passion week, uh, they're all there. They're all talking about the last week because this is everything that matters. Um, what happens at the end? Um, this, this is the whole point why Jesus came in the first place. So this is why they all focus on this. So anytime you see that they're all talking about something, there, there's, um, it's time for your ears to perk up. Um, Jesus goes to Bethany. Bethany is where in John 11, Jesus raises Lazarus, right? There's Mary and Martha. He goes to the house of Simon. The leper looks like he healed him because he still calls Simon the leper. That means he must've been a leper for a long time, probably. Um, and he says, um, so a couple of things here. He, here he's reclining at, at temple. And so I put, last time I said I was going to put this, um, uh, excuse me, reclining at table. So I put a few table ones here. Um, I put a number of these. Well, let, let me just start with this one. This is more of a fancier one for uh, the Greeks and the Romans. So um, these would be called essentially triclinium's, uh, three-sided. Um, of course, these guys, of course, they got to go extra. They got extra ones here. But you had, you had the servants and you had women and flutists, you know, entertaining. You rest on your left elbow um, and you're hanging out. This is your whole night. You're hanging out, you know, um, and you're eating and you're enjoying the music and maybe there's another room you go do something you know uh with one of the servants and so forth here's another one that they found it's called triclinia these are all the same things um these are public dining rooms and so they would have had this side this side and this side and you got these cushions and then they come in the middle and they serve you here um so you're you're you know you're, you're lying down essentially on your side um this one, you know, people just moving about, see how they're being entertained by these people, or they're reading poetry or something. Here's an actual one. These are all actual, but there's, even the synagogues had them. Um, and you see in the blue where they would have marked, I think, believe it's, um, these are the actual slabs of a synagogue that had it. So sometimes when you're reading that they just, uh, here you go, triclinium, meaning three couch room. When, they, when they're talking about they sat to eat, that's fine when they're 
when they speak of um, like a formal dinner, that's what they're talking about. They're, they're, they're speaking of the triclinium. Um, they, otherwise, they're kind of doing this kind of sitting, you know, just hanging out, sitting on the floor, hanging out, but still kind of, you know, around in the round. Um, some did sat at, at table, but not typically this is what they mean when they mean table. Um, all right, I'll leave that. Uh, where were we? So anyway, Jesus is in the house and he's reclining at table. So it was a formal, by the way, when you see that it's, this isn't, this isn't, these are sort of hints that maybe, you know, it, it's not captured, but that this probably would have meant that this is a, it would have been um, a wealthy home and a spacious home that had that kind of room because most people didn't have that kind of room. In fact, um, I had another one here. I've had a few of these in here already, but uh, so one of the, so here's different kinds of homes. This kind of home, um, you know, maybe it would have been a little more to do because they, they got two, a two story, but you have your animals with you. If you have your animals with you, you know, you're, you're not rich because you want to make sure nobody takes them. So you sleep with them with all that, you know, with all that stench. Here's another one. Um, and everything is, you know, just, just kind of comp compartmentalized, but you do all your work outside because what, what do you, you know, what are you hanging at, you know, at home for? So they were small. So if you had a, a triclinium, you had spaces, I mean, you had servants, because you don't have that unless you, you're able to serve it. You know, you have service. So you are wealthy. Now, most people, at least 90% of the people were poor, uh, pretty much everywhere, whether in the Roman world, Jews, and so forth. Um, so a woman, uh, she comes in with alabaster flask, remember this, uh, a pure nard. Um, this is a perfume, very costly, it says. So that's another clue. In this case, she comes in, so she's, She's got money too, because where did she get this? From? I have yeah. a quick. Sorry, they yeah. say that they're at the table in the home of Simon the leper, right? Mm -hmm. Is it usual that a leper would have money? Is it indicating that he had money, or just the woman with the jar? They're at his home, so so you you could have been rich or whatever. If you got leprosy, anybody could have gotten leprosy. I thought that people who had leprosy they had to be like banished to, like a cave. Yeah, and if and after, but Jesus heals him. Uh -huh. So yeah, this is a, we're only reading Mark here, but if you go through the parallel, G Jesus heals him. Um, if we go to, uh, so you can uh, let me find a good one here. Um, in the temple itself, let me find one that's written. Um, let me see. This one has should have it. So in the temple itself, when you go, so you have the whole you know, temple area, right? It's huge. And then you have the temple itself. This is a barrier but that's, that warns the Gentiles don't come in. We have at least two of those big slabs with the warning from, from the temple that I showed you is in here um, that threatens them uh, to be, that's why they got Paul, that they, they were going to kill him because they said he brought in a Gentile to this area because he was here. He, he, had a, he made a, a Nazarite vow in Acts 21 and 22. And he comes in here. And they say he brought him in here, that he wasn't a Jew. Um, they're trying to set him up. So he, he's here in this, in this um, area here. But look here, chamber of, of lepers in this corner here. This is a woman's courtyard. But the, the men would all go through here. This is where Jesus was. This is where the, you also have the treasury. So even they call it a women's courtyard. But everybody was in here. And this is also where they would... Um, um, you, you will bring in your animals and so forth. And then there's a big door here. Um, they call it the gate of the Nicanor huge. I think it's like 15 steps. So you, you would do certain things that you would do in here, certain rituals and so forth. Um, once you were healed, you had to stay away. I think it's seven days, whatever you go to your priest and so forth. And they get you, they check you out. This is from the old Testament, all these checks. And then eventually, you know, you can even come in here and, you know, sort of, um, get a bill you know of of um it's 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 like you get your uh you know your covet papers that you clear clean bill of health <laughs> yeah, cl yeah clean bill of health here's the here's the warning this is an actual stone from that time from the time of jesus that was there i think there's two of them there used to be i forget how many 
but this is in Greek and it's telling them, and it's in Greek and I think it's, I think it's only in Greek. I think they had others and maybe it was also in Latin that warned the Gentiles do not step into that area. They could be in the whole temple area, the whole thing, but not enter, see this barrier, do not, do not enter. Um, even Antonio Fortress, they had right there, access right through here to come through, right? To put down, that's when they, that's how they got Paul. They got him away from them. Um, so, but don't go in here. Otherwise there'd be blood. And that did happen. Um, I'm sorry, did, did that answer your question or? Uh... Yeah, I was just curious. I just always assumed that lepers were like poor and oh, no, like no, no. forever, you know? No, no, it's like the virus. Anybody could get it. Uh, leprosy is another thing. Uh, I think it's Hansen's disease. They're believing modern uh, scholars are thinking that it was probably more like, I think it's Hansen's disease, they call it. Um, but it's contagious. So it didn't matter who had it, you had to stay away. Um, you cannot, you, you, you know, you, you could still do certain rituals from far away, but you, can, you, you couldn't go. Um, but Jesus heals him. Um, and, and the stories are here. I mean, we get some stories. So this woman, we're not told who the woman is, but if we go to John 12, then we know who the woman is, right? It was Mary, the, brother, the sister of Lazarus. So um, that's another clue. Um, th there, there's something from over 100 years ago. There's a scholar um, called Undesigned. I mentioned this, I think, the, a long time ago. The, the scholar called Undesigned Coincidences, where there's a lot of passages and verses that you can glean and get information from that you get, you know, uh, that, that puts things together. Uh, the fact that she had this, they were wealthy. Uh, they had money, that the fact that they have a reclining at table, so forth, um, that they go into this person's house, that he has that kind of room. All these are clues that this is a wealthy home. Um, Lazarus is also wealthy. Um, you can glean that from uh, various passages. Actually, yeah, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole. Um, what time is it? Um, so anyway, she breaks it, and she so she anoints him days before um the you know he he is uh he's crucified um remember they they were doubting and they were upset and they were crying and everything and this is after the fact um and john this would have been john 12 for instance john 11 is when he raises him from the dead and they're so appreciative and it was so you know what well, you can imagine i mean he brought a brother back after four days being you know rotting uh in the tomb so she knows he's more than whatever she was. Well, what was she going to save that for? Um, but what happens is once she sees, oh, here we go. For this woman could have been sold for more than 300 denarii. Um, remember, denarii is a daily, a daily day's uh, wage. That's what people got paid, uh, a denarii. Most people did, the majority of people. You get a little coin. I, I think I, ha I have one there in the, in the folder, in the Google Drive. You know, it's just give them a little clink and that's it. So this is a year's wage um, that had that kind of money. So most people, they would never have done that. You know, they, they, they could, you know, they could do very well for several years, you know, um, investing in and so, and, you know, and on. So Jesus said, leave her alone. He doesn't stop them. Uh, I suppose because Jesus himself, the thing is that Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 talks about giving to the poor, right? Matthew 25, he says, I don't know you. And it's a Lord, what, what, what do you mean? He says, well, uh, or, or I know you, the ones on the right. He says, he says, when, um, when I gave it, um, when you did it to the poors of these, you did it unto me. Um, so what she was doing, she was uh, ahead of time, kind of like, in, this has to do with prophecy as well. She's anointing, uh, what well, says it here? She's anointing the anointed, right? For burial beforehand. They would do this and you saw Mary, Magdalene and the others, when they come in with all the perfumes and the myrrh and frankincenses and so forth. Um, because for one thing, it stunk. And you, you know, there's another way to care for the body for the individual, you know, showing them, you know, great love, but it was very expensive. Not anybody could do that. And they would use uh, many pounds of these things, uh, the other ones. This one she has in a flask, um, or, you know, it's, it's just expensive perfume. 
So, um, and truly, uh, and so it says gospel is proclaiming the whole world. So she says, just like remember Mary, um, something similar, both Marys, everybody's gonna remember you because of what you did. You know, that is, is uh, she, she gave a year's, you know, worth of wages away, which she probably could afford. And so, you know, who knows? But because of what she did and her intent, it was really her intent, just like the woman in the in the treasury, you know, the, the old lady with the two with the two mites. Um, they, they don't they're not worth anything. They're worth um, what we spoke. Uh, what was it? Eight minutes worth of wages, nothing. And that's all she had. Um, and the Lord singles them out. So, um, OK, then Judas is this is when Judas. Uh, one of, so this is, a, this, is a, this is something interesting to think about. Then Judas Iscariot, by the way, it's Iscariot because he was from Iscariot. Um, Judas Iscariot, who was, it's not like this, you know, necessarily was his last name. Uh, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priest in order to betray them, to, be, to betray them. Um, and when they heard it, they were glad, right? This also had to do a lot, um, well, we're not, as usual, we're not going to get to it, but it, we don't have to rush anyway. Um, a lot of these things that we're seeing here um, in this chapter, and we're going to see it also in the next chapter, we'll find, of course, in the different Psalms and Isaiah, but also in the book of Zechariah. So I would encourage you to read Zechariah. It's, I mean, it's, it's 14 chapters, but it's brief. They're like short chapters. Um, but you'll see as you're reading it, and then you read this, you'll start seeing that these things were supposed to be, you know, being ticked off, you know, one at a time. So um, let me see, I have one here. Um, no, I'll leave that one. And yeah, let's just keep going otherwise we're gonna, but th this is all, this is all in Zechariah. This is supposed to happen. What's interesting here is, um, if Jesus knew, right? Did Jesus, did Jesus not know? Well, it says he knew, because we're going to see this in a moment. So we're jumping ahead. That Judas uh, was going to betray him. If G Jesus is the one that picked his disciples, typically the disciples would be seeking a teacher, right? They would see him teaching and uh, they would want to be um, taught by that teacher and they would pay and so forth. It wasn't just like, you know, uh, Kind of like it's for free but then you're living with them and you're learning everything about them and you learn you know um you spend your life with them um for, you know for several years why did jesus pick judas if he knew that he was going to betray him notice that judas um went out with the 12 when they went out when they evangelize when they cast out demons raise the dead like jesus said uh, do miracles and healings and give his message of repentance, right? Believe and repent for the kingdom of God is near, right? Um, Judas did that. He says all 12 of them did it. Not just them, but he also sent others. Uh, remember the 70 or the 72? So what could, yeah. Well, isn't it because, well, obviously because God already knows like the plan, but wasn't it at some point that it, it said that um, then Satan entered into Judas? Yeah, that's going to happen now. But what I'm asking is, uh, like you said, God knows this, right? God knew this. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the one that's picking them. He's, he's picking them. They're not picking him. He's going around and picking the ones he wants to, uh, to follow him. Mm-hmm. And not just that, but there, there are others in his entourage that you'll see as you're reading the parallels. It wasn't just the 12, right? You have others. At one point, you have uh, probably a few hundred because we see this in um, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, where it says 500 brothers. And we don't know if that, just, if that means brothers and sisters or just if it's just brothers because the women aren't mentioned, then that's probably, if you add the women and maybe the children, that could be easily a thousand or 2000. Um, we know he had an entourage. There were others following him because it speaks of the women that were there at the cross, but even before that, how they, they were um, supporting his ministry. 
some of them were wealthy. Um, so Jesus, so some people would just follow him, but the inner, the, the 12, he picks them. Mm -hmm. So if Jesus knew, God knows that Judas was going to betray him, that he was a son of perdition. Um, well, for one thing, Jesus, remember in Mark 13, Jesus says that there are going to be false teachers, right? False prophets, and they're going to do miracles. They're going to do signs and wonders, uh, but do not follow them, right? He said, remember that I told you, he said, he, he, so God allows certain things to happen. So sometimes people flock, you know, to this person says, yeah, but the Lord uses her wonderfully or the Lord, oh, but he has the word, you know, he's got the rhema. I don't even know what that means because that's nothing in scripture like that. Like this is a, you know, like that's a thing, you know, it's a Greek word. Um, but they make this whole thing out of it, you know, um, it's got to be the rhema word, you know, it's like, yes, yeah, so they, these guys didn't do that. Um, it's stuff that people pick up on and they make the biggest thing out. Like, yeah, but you, you know, you saw that person that went in a wheelchair and they got up. Yeah. Well, the, the, the devil does miracles also, or God allows, even in the old Testament, he allows people that don't follow him to do his will. So in other words, we don't, we don't fall for just following after people just because it's not about the signs. And Jesus is clear about this in Mark 13, he says this a number of times. He says, remember that I told you, he says, do not follow them, right? Do not listen. Um, he says, if, if he didn't cut the time short, um, even, even, <laughs> even the so-called believers uh, might get weak in the knees. This is my paraphrase. <laughs> so, because people at some point go like, yeah, but that did happen, right? Yeah, but they must have something, you know, all of a sudden you start second guessing yourself um, and you, you go like, well, yeah, but it must be, but I, I don't understand. How could this be? How, why does it got to stop them? Um, but doesn't it also mention that, that you know, God uh, fashions some for destruction, right? Like he's the potter with the claims. Some are meant for destruction, he decides. Right. But so, right. So that, that, that goes to the point that um, we don't know by just because somebody does certain wonders, miracles, healings, um, or they have they're charismatic in their expressions, you know, they're really, you know, it's like, it really calls you and it's, it's like, wow, you know, you could be blessed, but that doesn't mean that they're doing the right thing. They could be in all kinds of sins. Right. So we, we, we're always attentive to what is happening. We don't, we don't fall into that trap just because they're doing things because we see this and we're going to see this more and more. Jesus said that that would happen. And every now and then you hear about these things and people get, they fall, they got, you know, they swoon, you know. But how about in the case, we saw, I know we only have a couple of minutes, but like, okay. you know, God gives someone a gift of, let's say, prophecy, right? And he never takes back that gift. But then let's say they go on their own path and they're using it not for, not to bring God glory, but themselves, right? And they still continue to prophesy and let's say, you know, whatever. Why does God still use them yet? Um, still, you know, like, why does he still use them if they're not doing it to bring him glory and they're doing it for themselves, but he doesn't revoke the gifts, but he still kind of uses them. You know yeah, what I mean? that, yeah. And that, that, that makes it worse for them. If you recall uh, the prophet Balaam, right? He was a hired prophet to curse Israel. He was hired to curse Israel. And mm -hmm. God shows up, the angel of the Lord. Um, if you, when you look at those passages, they go on for several chapters. Uh, it appears to be the pre-incarnate Christ. Um, and he tells him, you're going to do my bidding. He easily could have just shut him down. Could have killed him. Could have done whatever. But he says, no, I'm going to use you. But that doesn't mean that he was his, uh, that he was his servant in the positive sense. Um, remember the God calls it during the exile. He says, um, he says, my servant, uh, Cyrus, 70 years from now, he's going to, or, or years from now, he, he's going to, um, release my people. Uh, 
I had hinted at this before, but he calls him his Mashiach, his Messiah. So just because you see the word doesn't mean that he is the Messiah. In fact, there are others that are called Messiah um, that aren't, you know, who you think they might be. So just because it uses the word anointed Mashiach doesn't mean that he's the one, you know, as in the Christ. He's the, he's, he's, he's singled out for that purpose, but he wasn't a God fearer. So we, th this, this happens in scripture. So just because, you know, we see something, this is why I'm, um, we're doing these, right? We, we have to zoom out and look at the context. Uh, oh, we're done. But we have to zoom out and look at the context and say, wait a minute, what has happened? We have to ask the questions. We got to wrestle with it, talk about it, look, see it in different translations um, and not just, just make a determination. Remember how we started today by talking about plausible arguments that sound fine, that sound reasonable, like that guy, you know, that past so-called pastor with the spit, you know, the whole thing. It, sound, it probably sounded good in their heads when they were, you know, like Beavis and Buffett, you know, they, they, were, they were conjuring it up. But at some point, you know, people start looking into that. It's a good thing that people are still thinking, you know, whereas some mm -hmm. people in the church were squir squirming in that church. Others were like, yeah, yeah, you know, they fall into mm -hmm. it because there's no proper understanding. There is no wisdom as in Proverbs 9. You know, we're not going back to the source. If we focus too much on what they're doing, we miss it. If we focus more on authenticity, what, what does, how does the word of God operate? How does God operate who he is, his holiness and so forth? Then when we see something, we can we can spot a counterfeit, or we say we maybe we don't know. We go like, like my grandmother used to do. You know, my uh, my dad's mom go like, four. <laughs> no, my father used to say, four. Like wait, you smell? I'm smelling thing. Yes, yeah, you me? Oh, sorry. You know, <laughs> <laughs> go take a shower. <laughs> so you want to have you want to you know you you want to have that sort of a uh, olfactory sense, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So let's leave it there. We'll, we'll keep picking up um, more next time. Thank you all. Uh, on 14? On 14? Yeah, we'll keep on. Yeah, we'll keep going on 14. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Try thank to read Zachariah if you can. Thank you all. Okay. Bye. Bye. God bless.